Welcome to today's show. 
Thank you all for being here. I appreciate your company, as always. Um, it's kind of hot here in Tokyo, still still in the uh, grip of heat and summer. And um, wow, questions straight off the bat. I like that. I like that. We've got a full, full show today to try and fit everything in, to try and make everything happen. So many things uh, going on. I see we've got some new people in the chat, some names that I haven't seen. Welcome. It is a live stream. Oh, thank you, White Tiger. It is a white stream. Uh, a white stream. It is a live stream every Monday night, 6 p.m. This time, usually it's for two hours, but for the past couple of weeks, we've been running. It's been chaos, absolute chaos. As a lot of you know, Descent into Avernus did not happen on Saturday as we had planned and built towards to go into it would be depressing suffice it to say that there was a contractual problem no don't worry we will get everything up and running for this saturday so descent into avernus the blood war kicks off if you haven't been to our website yet i suggest you go and have a look there's something i think is very exciting there the web goblin is still working on it uh, to make sure that it's absolutely spiffy for this saturday's launch you are going to be able to influence the game in descent uh, into avernus far more so than you were able to influence it in ghosts of salt marsh we're going to use all of the npcs that you guys provided for ghosts of salt marsh we're going to transport those over into avernus and there's so much more going on there as well so if you haven't had a look www.greatgamemaster.com go check it out there's some interesting stuff happening there that's for next week saturday though we're talking today and today we've got a whole bunch of things going on. We've got your questions coming through. I'm very aware that an hour goes by very quickly. We're only going to be an hour today. Usually it's two hours. It's only an hour today, again, because there is so much stuff happening that I need to make sure is going to play out correctly. So that's something to bear in mind. I've also been recording videos all morning so far. It's 10 o'clock here in Tokyo, Japan, which is where I live. So I've been recording videos all morning. I've got more videos to record this afternoon. I try and record a month's worth of videos in advance so that there's time to do all sorts of other things like the book and the modules and the podcasts and all of the other stuff that we do on this channel. Today, we're going to be looking at some very cool things that have come across my desk in the last week or so and that I think will be of interest to you guys. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit and then we're going to do questions. So I see the questions are starting to come through. Let's hold those questions just for a little bit. Let's start doing questions at 20 past the hour. So wherever you are in the world, 20 past the hour is when we will start questions. But for now, I want to start taking you through some things that I think are of interest to you. Now, some of you might know that I worked on the Nerdarchy Kickstarter Out of the Box Encounters, which was a book that they have uh, successfully uh, funded on Kickstarter, and it worked really, really well for them. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting product, and that has spawned, uh, or yeah, spawned a, a very interesting event that I've now been commissioned to work on, which is the Nerdarchy Convention, which is going to be happening much, much, much later next year only. But it's starting to build now. And I'm putting together the trailer for this thing. And let me tell you, this is a sneak peek here. This is going to be the convention to beat all conventions. If you like YouTubers that talk about role playing and crafting and, and design, that's where you're going to be. That's where you are going to be. Philadelphia next year, October. Mark it down. It's going to be an amazing, amazing event. So that's kind of happening. Now, somebody else who's doing a Kickstarter and whose work I have featured on this channel multiple times, and I even see them in the Twitch channel, so hello DM Scotty, is DM Scotty. The stuff that he does on his YouTube channel, building stuff, crafting stuff, is phenomenal. It's always very good quality, and I've been chatting to him, and they've got a Kickstarter going, which I want to talk about very briefly uh, today, because I think it is something that you will enjoy. If you're old school like me, this is going to bring back memories. So I'm talking about this Kickstarter, and you can find it, you can see it going up already. It's listed in yen because I am in Japan and Kickstarter has decided that yen is important. So it looks like 455,000 yen. Oh my goodness, this is amazing. 
it's nice, but uh, when you tra translate that into dollars or something else, it um, oh wrong wrong hover over. It's six and a half thousand Australian dollars, which is fantastic. So they're halfway to their goal. This book, The North Road, is uh, I think something that's of great value. Now I'm not going to play the video for you. You can go and have a look at that in your own time. But the idea here is that this Kickstarter, this series of adventures based on on the North Road are generic enough that you can drop them in almost anywhere and to a large degree a system agnostic too. So you can use it almost anywhere, which I think, well, system neutral, they call it, I call it system agnostic. So this is something, if you want a very well written, it's two uh, very, very experienced role players who've come together and you get this, this book. Now they sent me the book. So I'm going to open it up. I'm going to open it up down here. They sent me some of the stuff, the Loyalist This Is Adventure 2 that's in, in that. And that's, of course, Gareth um, Barrett and Scotty McFarlane. We all know DM Scotty. And so there you can see it's all laid out. But these illustrations, if you're like me, this is stuff that came straight out of the 80s sort of um, fantasy space. I loved this period uh, in terms of, of creativity and fantasy because it was kind of new and that sort of thing. What I also like, though, and I was speaking to DM Scotty before the show happened, is that he's also got photographic um, reconstructions of things that happen within the, in the book. Now, I know for a fact that 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 particular ball of teeth and spines and stuff I reviewed on this show months ago as to how he made it out of polystyrene and tooth uh, the tines of a plastic fork and uh, bits of plant material so you can not only run the module run the adventures in your game but then you can go and make this stuff I think this is super cool to include the idea of yes we've got illustrations which is what we used to in these kind of things and then we've got these kind of images imagine building this kind of stuff so as they walk into this little town that's part of the module there are these little spaces that you have made and of course if you want to know how to do that head on over to Scotty's channel. It's really, really, really worth it. And this is just one adventure, by the way, that I'm still scrolling through, and that makes up part of the book. So it's a, it's a big enterprise that they're doing. If you're in the market for a new series of adventures, you want to support these guys, head on over to Kickstarter. I'll bring it up. There it is again. Head on over to Kickstarter. Look for The North Road, a fantasy RPG campaign book. It's there. I'll even post the link up into the chat if you want to to go and support them. And that would be great. I think it's going to be super cool. We're going to get DM Scotty uh, onto the show at some point where we'll talk all things crafty and crafting. So I think that could be very cool. Now, if I look at the comments, there's people saying, oh, it's very Steve Jackson, uh, Ian Livingston. Yes, absolutely. I've got Steve Jackson and Ian Livingston's book, Dungeoneer, down here. Absolutely adored that. Very reminiscent of those kinds of things. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, just reading through it, yes, it works really, really, really well. So that's something to bear in mind, to keep in, 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 your, in your headspace that uh, campaign runs until the end of September so definitely something to look out there uh, I see Lance Pickett saying I'm older school than you are absolutely yes so there we are in terms of what is the yen to the dollar I have no idea but um, I think you will you will find Google gives you the answer for that one without a doubt without a doubt Okay, so yes, um, I think we can now start to turn our attention to uh, things on the channel. And there are some questions that have already come through. Tropico Boy, I see, has been posting up a lot of questions, or the same question multiple times. It's a little bit of a head of schedule, but I think it's worth uh, worth having a look at. Uh, DM Scotty is in the Twitch channel. Um, not sure how long DM Scotty will be there for, but uh, yes, if you have questions, you can jump onto Twitch and have a, a, a chat to him. Uh, otherwise, I'm sure you can find him uh, around to answer those. Now, like I said, I've been doing videos, excuse me, just for a second. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I've been doing videos all morning, so my throat is a bit dry. So I popped down to the vending machine. If you don't know Tokyo, if you don't know Japan, vending machines are everywhere. My apartment building, I think they're about 
probably 25 apartments it's not a huge apartment building we have our own private vending machine in the driveway so i popped down there to go and grab a something to drink just before the show started and the usual stuff that i drink has been replaced by something new and i am not a sponsor i don't know who they are i don't know what this is it's called detective conan uh, it's obviously some kind of uh, promotion that they're running. I don't know what's in it. It is definitely not healthy to drink. 22k calories, 22,000 calories, um, 5.4 grams of something, which I'm assuming is sugar, because that's usually what it is. So I'm going to have a sip of it, and then I bought a second one just in case. This is the joy I find. This is the joy of living in a country where you can't read the language or you don't understand the language and you get to experiment so this is a live experiment it's a milky white kind of color um inside so here we go okay so there we go michael fox giving us some insight there um detective conan is an anime that's been running for 20 years okay well this soft drink it's carbonated It has, it's very subtle. I like it. I want to say pineapple, but it's like memory of pineapple. Anyway, it's lovely. So Detective Conan, I think uh, it's a winner. If you can get a copy of this, uh, great. Right, now for that. Let's get on to questions. Let's do some questions. Um, okay, Honorable 596 says, Ever had someone play the Blood Hunter class? from Critical Role. I haven't... I don't run a huge amount of games. I mean, that being said, I do run the game on, on the D&D channel, and there uh, we we um, stick to to what is available. Oh, thank you so much for that, um, Tolicha Vervusta. We do appreciate that. Two dollars is, I think, about 220 yen. So I think it's about that sort of space. Anyway, um, so I run I run it on on there where you use Fantasy Grounds, and of course you can buy modules for Fantasy Grounds that would allow you to use um, certain pre pre made classes like the Blood Hunter class. I haven't had anyone want to play the Blood Hunter class in my games, but again, like I said, I run that one, and occasionally I do one or two other games on the side. But usually I haven't, so I have not had anyone play that. If anyone else has played the Blood Hunter, please feel free to comment uh, in uh, the chat. So there we are. Okay, right, next one. Uh, coconuts, perhaps, says the mighty Flamberge. Um, more pineapple than coconut. Could be coconut, but there's, there's, there's that sweetness to it. Um, so, yes, potion testing 101. Don't know what it is? I sip it. Yes. Also have a standby one in case the first one doesn't work out. This one is definitely grape. That's grape. But there's a yogurt on the side as well, which is interesting because it's clear water. So you can't see the grape because it's being keyed out. But th those are grapes. So I had that on standby in, t in case Detective Conan tasted terrible. Anyway, more questions. Luigi Squeegee says, what are some suggestions for gaining inspiration for writing unique lore? That's a very expansive question. However, Luigi Squeegee, I would suggest that you actually go to the very first video that we released on our YouTube channel, which I think was called Storytelling 101, or it was just, it's a very first video that we released four years ago now. And... Um, what it talks about is the four different ways in which we have imagination, which is basically how we get inspiration for writing unique law. What is unique law? Well, the biggest thing is, what is law? What do you know about? So I would always suggest go and research the law of other people. Now, frequently you'll see on the YouTube channel, I'll talk about, well, there's this sort of law that comes from these kinds of people. The Aztecs have got this one or the, the latest one, for example, is the Native American Indians or the Aboriginal Americans, as they're now uh, called. I'm not sure what the right nomenclature is. I'm not up to date with that. Um, so if anyone can give me a definitive, this is definitely what we are, are calling people who were originally from North America. Uh, that would be great. But you get just enough law 
to get some inspiration. You go, oh, okay, so that's the naming convention. Or that's not the naming convention. That's what we think is the naming convention. And then you base on that. So I would say research, research, research. Think of a culture whose law you like. Go and research some of their law, and that will give you inspiration. Think about how it would be changed based on the races within your campaign. So if it's a sci-fi campaign, how would you take Aztec law and translate it, oh, the carbonated drink is coming through. How would you then translate that into something usable within your campaign? So that's something to think about. Okay, Tropico Boy's question just flitted off the screen, and he has been asking it for a long time. I start, I'm starting my first campaign session soon, and they are starting by raiding a dead king's tomb. I was wondering how to make fighting skeleton, skeletons more interesting, and the dead king... Uh, has a spectral protector. Okay, so Tropico Boy, the most important thing to bear in mind is don't think of a fight as just being your monsters versus your player characters. Think of a fight in terms of there's, there's various ways of looking at it. I like the three Ps, pain, punishment, and problems. Um, the th Look at the, 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 the pain that the skeletons are going to be delivering. They don't do a lot of damage, depending on what system you're using. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be easy to fight. If they deal more damage than they are listed as doing in the book, that's okay. You can do that. You have the power as the game master to increase the amount of damage. But also look at the pressure. What if the tomb is starting to collapse whilst they're fighting those skeletons? And they have to stay within a certain, let's say, circle that provides energy to the tomb to keep the tomb up. But the skeletons, instead of attacking to deal damage, are trying to drag them out of that circle. It's still a combat with skeletons, but now if they get dragged out of the circle, the building starts to collapse. So they have to stay in that circle for 10 rounds without being dragged out of it. So it's no longer hit armor class, hit armor class. Now it's strength versus strength. So that's something to bear in mind. That's something to keep in the back of your head as, as, as a way of doing it. Give them a different problem. The skeletons die, but they resurrect straight away because there's a strange idol on the other side of a pit that seems to have the power to resurrect undead. So they need to get to that idol because otherwise fighting the skeletons is never going to help. So bear that in mind. James Tension asks, um, any news on the Broken World Chronicles? Well, I would love to go back to the Broken World Chronicles, but at the, at the moment, there is just not enough time. And I'm going to tell you why. We've got Descent into Avernus, which kicks off. That's in the next 12 weeks of absolute awesome goodness and fun. So I'm really looking to, forward to Descent into Avernus. We are also, and this is a sneak peek for those of you that have come through to the live show, we are also going to be launching a new series called Game Masters Play, GMP for short. So we're recording that on the 27th of September. And then every month thereafter, we will be releasing another, uh, we will be recording another one. What it is, is we are going to take a role playing system, not a Dungeons and Dragons role playing system. We are going to take a role playing system from another publisher. I get together a bunch of game masters, people from YouTube, from around the space, all wherever I happen to find them. They get given the rule book and they have exactly 20 days to learn the rules for that gaming system. They create a character, we play a live session, we play a session in that space, and then we rate it. But it's really robust in terms of how we look at the system. There's a score that the system gets at the end of the day, and it's diverse GMs. So we've done this before many, many, many years ago on the channel originally. But that was when we were still learning how to use YouTube, how to use cameras. That was before online role playing became a major thing in my space anyway. So that's going to be really exciting, I think, anyway. And we're looking at, OK, so this system uses this technique. This system uses that technique technique and I think it's going to be insightful and I think for you guys it's going to be really really cool to be able to say well I don't like that GM style but I like that GM style they're more simulationist they're more mechanical they're more narrative they're this they're that so I think that's going to be really cool 
so we're doing that. So the long and short of it is as long as there is the D&D stream, that takes up a good portion of my week. This new stuff takes up a good portion of my week. So Broken World Chronicles is still on hold. Having said that, for Game Master's Play, we have got Freddy coming back to join the table for at least the very first one. And we will go from there. So Kai, I would love to get Kai involved as well. Uh, and maybe that will happen. So the team is definitely going to get together again. Make no mistake, we're definitely coming back. Okay, uh, next question. Suden says, um, oh wait, that's a collect, that's a question for chat. Huh, the collective, what is the collective noun for a gathering of GMs? That's interesting. I'm tempted to say a role of GMs, but given the fact that a lot of GMs have lots of roles, uh, not only in the dice realm, that might be insulting. I'm not sure. Uh, Grizzle's uh, question uh, says, I know it has been some time. Has there been any discussion on another uh, game of many players game being run on the Discord server? So what Grizzles is talking about is an enterprising team of individuals got together and created, uh, with my help, a role-playing system for 100 role-players to play the same game at the same time on our Discord server. It was insane. We had, I think, 80 players and 10 GMs running around coordinating this massive undead attack. There was an undead dragon flying around. It was absolutely insane. It was crazy fun. There was so much stuff going on. Uh, that channel is still active, and I, I have to admit, I haven't been very active in that channel. The guys were talking about revamping stuff, so I will follow up. I will go into that uh, channel and say, hey guys, I know they've been rewriting stuff, they've been planning stuff, they've got different mechanics going on. I've recently seen some maps going out that they've been designing. So yes, Game of Many Players may very well be back uh, for another session, because that was a lot of fun, it really was. Maybe we'll try and do it over December. Let's see, I'll poke Laura Bones and, and the rest of the team to see what's going on there, Sam and company. Time Runs Out says, what are key rules to know as a starter game master? I think uh, time runs out that the key, the key rule as the game master is that you are exploring as much as the player characters are. Game masters get a lot of pressure. They get a lot of expectation. They have to know the systems. They have to make good rules calls. They have to be impartial. They have to create amazing stories. There's all this kind of pressure. There's all this, this stuff on the game master that they have to do. But I think ultimately you need to remember that you are exploring as much as they are. So you're exploring your world, you're exploring your adventures, you're exploring all that kind of stuff. The baseline, I would say, is always fall back onto what is fun. What is the most fun? Is it looking up the rules to try and make a correct rules call? Or is it just making a decision on the fly, making that rules call, and then moving on to the next thing? and then going back to look at it. That's also something that I, I, I really advocate, is take it slow, take it easy, and look at what is the most fun thing to do in that period, and then go back and fix it later on if you, if you need to, or learn from it. So there we are. We're gonna take questions for another three minutes, and then we're gonna talk about something else that's come across my desk. Phil the Pipe says, what kind of ways would you use to keep goblins interesting at higher levels. I promised my players a goblin slayer campaign and don't just want to throw higher numbers at them. Fill the pipe, again, I would go back to that video, three GMs or GM secrets. Um, if someone can find that link, they can post the link up and chat and I'll give them 500 experience points. It came out fairly recently, the three points, pain, pressure and problems uh, based on a wonderful uh, video that uh, I saw on a channel, I think it's Runehammer, um, had a similar idea. I extrapolated it further into the social encounters as well. But what that's going to do is that's going to allow your players, your players to fight goblins where the goblins are doing much more and much better and much more interesting things. They're not just going in for an attack. They are planning, they're plotting, they're working around things. So that when the players hit the goblins, the goblins are going to die instantaneously. They're just going to take massive amounts of damage. That's not the problem, though. The problem is, is that there's so many goblins that they're causing so many things to happen. Remember, if you are a goblin horde and you have 200 members, the party might be lured away into a cave where the goblins' aim is not to kill the party. 
the goblin's aim is co to cause that cave to collapse, trapping the party in the cave where there are other monsters that are in that cave that the goblins know about, which are more powerful and more dangerous, whilst the goblins outside are now free to cause chaos and mayhem because the party is away. So think about how are the goblins going to get around the problem of this party. Put yourself in the position of the goblin leader going, all right, so we don't want to die again. We can't fight them in open combat. What are we going to do? Right, if we get them away, then, well, quite possibly, maybe then they go away. So, all right, let's uh, hire an actress from town to pretend to be a long-lost princess who's got a kingdom somewhere, and they're going to go rescue the king. So come up with, with inventive ways that the goblins are trying to get the players away. We can't beat you, so let's get you away. Or perhaps the goblins hire the party. All right, look, look, don't hit us. We're going to give you money. Look, we've got gold. Please, go go kill this dragon for us. Uh, we've got a secret route in or something along those lines. So that's something to think about. Hero Metzler says, I've been following along loosely with the campaign creator series, but I started thinking, what if my players don't want to play in this world campaign? Any advice? To be perfectly honest with you, uh, Hero Metzler, you need to have asked beforehand. Hey guys, I'm thinking of creating this campaign world that features uh, spaceships and spaghetti monsters. What do you guys think? If your player part, player base goes, oh god no, that sounds terrible, then you don't create that world setting. So that's that's retroactive advice, and it's never useful, and I hate that kind of advice. But that's where you should start is asking your players what do they want first and then starting to cater for that because they're going to have expectations which you can then use to manipulate. On the other hand, now that you've got to the point where you're like, well, <laughs> what if they don't like this campaign? This morning, I recorded a video which will come out, I want to say next week, but I could be a liar, but it will be coming out in the next three weeks for sure where we talk about sandbox. So let's say, for example, you've created your campaign, your players go, it sucks. They usually will be talking about the plot. They won't be talking about the locations. Unless you've got some weird locations and restrictions and things which are going to hamper them. Rather than, than abandoning that idea, abandon your plot. Abandon your plot and go sandbox for a while until you can figure out a new plot. So again, if you've been watching the Campaign Creator series, I've done some work but not a huge amount, not a huge amount. And that's why, is so that you can sort of pull back and go, oh, all right, okay, uh, they don't like this direction, let's go in that direction. So that's something to bear in mind. Think about that for a little bit. Okay, I do not see any questions on my screen, so that means it's time for us to talk about something else. So something else that has come across my desk, and you will be seeing uh, me on their channel. This is something that I think is is... Very interesting. And when they got hold of me, they said, um, do you want to be on this person's show? And I went, ah, 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 what? What show? What person? Who are they? What are they doing? Um, and they went, no, no, no it's this show. It's, it's based on this. So I went along and I had a look and I was blown away. So if you don't know who this is, Dimension 20, Fantasy High. They're running a marathon this weekend where they're releasing just a whole bunch of shows. Just type in Fantasy High Dimension 20. There is the DM and the player characters, uh, obviously, are the cartoons around him. Those are not the actual players. Uh, those are the characters. Uh, it's set in a high school and it is the craziness and chaos that you can expect. A lot of fun to watch. These guys have got just boundless energy and I was watching going this is to me it's just super exciting it's super cool now I'm going to be on that show not in the role playing but I'm going to be on a, 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 an interview kind of thing uh, in October later on so I'll talk more about that but yes if you are looking for a new show to watch and you decide that Avenus is too dark or uh, you don't want demons and devils you would rather go and relive your uh, high school days then these guys are definitely worth a watch uh, I'm going to be checking them out uh, as they run this uh, marathon of, of their shows could be a lot of fun there is as i said the energy is just phenomenal so fresh and bright and who doesn't want to relive their high school days mm, 
Anyway, so definitely, definitely something to have a look at. Oh, wow. Luminia Mole. That is absolutely, absolutely amazing. Thank you for that. Um, I'm actually going to ask uh, that, that. That's insane. Um, uh, right. So uh, you, I'm so glad that you appreciate this stuff. I'm literally I'm literally flabbergasted. Uh, wouldn't you send me an email? Uh, at uh, so it's geekstable at gmail.com uh, that is absolutely phenomenal I really appreciate that kind of donation I don't think anyone is going to knock you off of your uh, position as our monster I think that's monster of the month let alone of the week I really appreciate that thank you um, I'm glad that the videos help if you uh, drop me that email geekstable at gmail.com we can then talk about that so yes let's um, right train wreck brain freeze rethink uh what were we talking about were we talking about yes we were talking about fantasy high school doesn't didn't your high school have demons and devils i was the devil in my high school to be perfectly honest with you i um i i i, I look back at my school years and i go well i think i helped other people become stronger uh because i was such a, a, a sort of dictator perhaps that's why i like being a gm because i like being in charge anyway back to some questions white tiger 225 says if the rewards in a system seem to slow my game's pace how game breaking would it be to double them do you think uh you play mecton zeta or Z zeta zeta i suppose you pronounce it mecton zeta 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 no, i don't know anyway i i have always looked at leveling up or as advancement as something that the game master should control a lot of players like it because they can work towards things they can work towards milestones and um you know they can they can sort of gauge their progress if it's slowing your game down double it without a doubt without a doubt or simply ignore it and move on to milestone leveling you know there's lots of systems out there i am not familiar with mecton zeta or zeta um there are lots of things that one looks at um the coder system for example where levels were irrelevant you just got advancement points and you could you could create a character who was level 20 but had similar skills to a level one character but just more skills more more points in those skills uh, but the same health, the same sort of things there. So definitely, I think, something to look at uh, in that sense. Just make it work for your game. That's as far as I'm, I'm concerned. Uh, so yes, definitely, definitely look at it that way. A uh, question from Honorable596 says, Would you give a character proficiency in Herbalist's kit if they have a proficiency in Alchemist's tools? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. And I'll give you the reason why. Alchemy is the, or was anyway in the real world, the specific intention of turning base metals or base things into gold. And then there was the elixir of life, which sometimes gets mixed in there. But generally, it was the foundations of modern day science. They were trying to mix things together to make gold. They never, of course, succeeded. They got close multiple times in terms of creating things like um, uh, iron parietes and and that sort of thing, but it it didn't really didn't really kick off. Herbalism, on the other uh, on the other hand, is looking at herbs and understanding what kind of properties plants have. Now, I would consider myself more of a herbalist than I would an alchemist, simply because I've spent a long time in Africa, and in Africa you learn, oh, that plant is poisonous, that plant protects you from sunburn, that plant reduces headaches, that plant induces uh, diarrhea, that plant uh, you would put on a wound if you, if you have a bleeding wound, it will help you. That plant you don't go anywhere near. So I think that the two are very different disciplines and although there is a certain sense of mixtures tincture tinctures and ointments that are being made on both sides that's as close as they get vitalios motikas says how would you play an insane mad creature like dero founded in the 3.5 monsters manual insane and mad creatures i think need to be played very cleverly so this is the difference. An insane or 
an insane creature that is completely nuts. It has no idea of what's going on around it, like a rabid animal, for example. There's certain instincts that are still there, but generally speaking, it will just attack anything that comes near it. It will eat on it for a little bit. It'll leave it behind because there's still that survival thing sitting in the back of its mind, no matter how deranged it is. So I would look at that. I would I would never just have them. Uh, or put it this way, the scary insane is when they are apparently not insane but they are completely and utterly bonkers so the the doctor who smiles at everyone and is very polite but in the background likes to put hot irons into somebody's body because they like the sounds of their tears falling on the floor and if they don't cry they use more or whatever i mean it's, it's insane it's madness so there's two different ways of, of playing that. And the Darrow, I, I remember the name, but I don't remember the creature at all, to be honest with you, is something that I think you would need to, to look at. Where do they sit? What do they do? How do we drive that? So something to think about, something to bear in mind. Um, all right. Uh, James Tension. Yes, herbalism and alchemy are often seen as the same thing. Uh, Elder Scrolls. Yes, definitely Elder Scrolls. Um, it, it, to a degree, Elder Scrolls. I play a lot of Elder Scrolls. And yes, butterfly wings and bits of this and eggshell. And there is definitely a, 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 a thing there that's come together. But when you look specifically, herbalism and alchemy, as far as I can see, in, in the D&D context anyway, they are quite separate. But again, this is the joy that we have. And if you want to do that, you're more than welcome to do that. You need to let your players know, hey, guys, by the way, when you're creating a character, I'm putting herbalism and alchemy uh, and medicine. I'm combining all three of those together. So if you've got the medicine skill, because we don't have an institutionalized pharma pharmacological company, your medicine is actually using herbs. So your herbalism is, is uh, based off of your medicine skill. It's not based off of your survival skill or wherever. So definitely, definitely something to look at. Uh, Mustafolos, Mustafolos, uh, first time listener, first time caller. There we go. Okay. I want my players to head into Descent into Avernus, but naturally from our current campaign. Any thoughts on getting them into Baldur's Gate smoothly without starting over? Why does it have to be the Baldur's Gate? If you want to use Baldur's Gate, go for that. But again, I would lead, I would lead them there by having some adventures. Let them hear of an opportunity in Baldur's Gate to go and hunt down uh, monsters or something. If you're not going to be using the, the, the line of thought that comes from Baldur's Gate, which uh, from the Avernus book, which drops today, by the way, 17th. Uh, if you uh, want to support the channel, head on over to our Amazon uh, page and buy it um, through that. We're an affiliate of Amazon. What can I say? We've all got to eat. But yes, I would... Think about it. When you look at the Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus book, there is a lot going on in Baldur's Gate. So if you're going to pick up a copy of that, definitely look at that. Because from what I have seen, from what I have understood, you could get your players in there without a problem. There's a thing, there's things happening within Baldur's Gate that cause things to happen. So your players don't even have to get to Baldur's Gate if you don't want to. There's a major cataclysmic event that occurs that leads directly into hell, directly into Avernus, and you could get your players in there from a forest location or a mountain location. It doesn't need to be a Baldur's Gate at all. It, it can be anywhere. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Like I said, when I read that book, I was so blown away by the, the ideas that are in that book, but also at the malleability of it. So definitely, whoops, definitely something to bear in mind, bear in mind there. Senior Samurai says, I'm new to writing campaigns and I want to get into Starfinder. How would I tie in the campaign I've written if they go to some random planet? Or do I prevent it? No, 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 no. You do not prevent. If your players want to go left, they go left. So a few things, a few things for you to have a look at. Head on over to the channel. There's a video on space, creating planets on the fly. 
so that if your players want to go and explore planets every single session, you don't have to stress about coming up with all these different planets. So there's a video on space designing planets. There's a video coming out very soon uh, on the campaign creator series. I'm not sure what the title will be just yet, but it's basically sandboxing, which is what you're talking about. Your players are going to go off in different directions. How can you control the direction they go in? You cannot and should not. Throw out adventure hooks. If they ignore it and they want to go to Tower Alpha Seti 5 over there, they're going to Tower Alpha Seti 5 over there. And you need to follow along. But enjoy the journey. Don't think of it as like, oh my god, must I stop them from doing it? Look at it and go, yes, they're going somewhere where I haven't been before either. An opportunity for me as the game master to explore that. Starfinder, Star Trek, Star Wars, it doesn't matter what the sci-fi setting is. It doesn't even matter that it's sci-fi. This applies to fantasy as well. Let them go in whatever direction they want to and enjoy the journey with them. Uh, again, this video is going to drop in two weeks' time or a week's time. I'm not sure. The Web Goblin determines the fate of these things. But it will help you in terms of, of looking at that. Map making is, is key. And again, and I'm going to say this because I'm part of it. Project Deos, which we were talking about last month, has a science fiction map making, galaxy making component to it. When they, when they announced this, I was like, yes, I wanted yesterday. So we're going to get that. We're going to get that. But it will make our lives so much easier in the future when that is the case. And it's like, up oh, random spawn, random spawn, random spawn, solar system, solar system, solar system. <gasps> I cannot wait for it. I cannot, cannot wait for it. Okay. All right. Lots of questions coming through. Really, really, really cool. Um, let's see. Um, 802... K Mighty, so 820,000 Mighty says, I have a player that wants to tame a dragon. The more I read about it, the harder it is to have it make sense, since they are basically all powerful beings that won't want to be owned as a pet. Yes, you are quite right. Cats, cats come to mind when we look at, when we look at something along these lines. Cats, unlike dogs are fairly isolatory beings. So the idea that cats live with us, we always have these, these notions that cats are supercilious creatures that own us. I would look at it that way. Have the player find an egg and start to raise this little dragon. And as the dragon gets into its teenage years, you're going to have to look at how time transpires because your first, how long does it take a dragon to grow from egg? It hatches, is it one month? Is it 20 years before the thing starts to even grow? How long does it take for a dragon to start growing? What is the time frame? You need to understand that on your space. And so for the first 50 years, and if the players are human, they're not going to live longer than their dragon gets to the age where, oh, look, he's just starting to fly. Oh, that's so cute. That might take 50 years for them to get there. So decide on that. And then if you want to, if you if you are of the mind where you go, 50 years pass. And the adventures that you all go on are amazing. You all get to level up once. Because you went on one adventure and then the stuff happened. 50 years have passed. The dragon is now a teenager. And it flies off at random. And burns down haystacks and villages and towns. And the player, is, the player character is known as the owner. Bounty hunters are going to arrive and say, there's a certain lord that wants to talk to you and your pet dragon, if you wouldn't mind. So then they arrest the player, and the player character, well, the player character, anyway, the player character tells the dragon, do not burn down towns. And the player dragon goes, you're not the lord of me, you're not my boss, you're not my father, I don't have to live under your roof, I can fly away tomorrow. You can then start to explore those things, if you really want to. And ultimately it gets to the point where the dragon is like, I could squash you like a bug. I am leaving. You're my pet now. Now I get to put you on the leash and take you walkies and take you out and tell you go potty uh, out in the garden. Now it's my turn. Uh, so, so you could certainly twist it around if you wanted to do it that way. Or have different species of dragon. So you've got gigantic dragons. The big noble dragon that's got all of the knowledge and the power and the conniving that the books have. You then have... Subdragons, worms, W-Y-R-M, although they don't have wings, wyverns, all of those kind of things, drakes, all of those could be a potential. Oh, you thought it was a silver dragon? Nah, it's a, it's a silver drake. They're still powerful and they'll make an excellent mount, but they're not very smart. They're pretty much like a horse. 
So, play with it. Never say no. I always say try and find a reason why the answer should be yes. And then work and build on that. So, there we are. You've just had a tour de force of what I do. Okay, there are still some questions floating around. I don't see any on my screen at the moment. No, wait a minute. There's, there's, there's one there and there's another one there. Okay, James uh, Saltarella and IKSSBBWS09. I will answer your questions. Scorch Claw question coming through. Again, though, before we do that, something else has come across my desk, and you guys will be experiencing this um, in the future, but I'm giving you a heads up because it could be quite a lot of fun, is this book which popped in. So lots of things going on. So this book, Legendary Kingdoms, The Valley of Bones. Now, they got hold of me a long time ago, and they said, hey, would you review our book? And I said, well, well, is it something that's of interest to you guys? Because that's usually the questions I ask. And they said they think it is. So they sent me the book. I have it here. They sent me the book. Nice soft cover book. It arrived. Um, and I started to look through it. And I went, but this, this looks like Fabled Lands. Now, if you haven't been on the channel for long, Fabled Lands is a series of books that I grew up with and very much admired. And the authors, I count as friends. Well, they're certainly friends of mine on Facebook. And every now and again, we, we share a jibe or two. And um, the artwork is similar. The layout of the book is very similar. But there's a big difference. And that big difference is, let me go here. This is their website, legendarykingdoms.co.uk. The big difference is in Fabled Lands, you played as a solo character. Legendary Kingdoms has got a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of stuff, but you have a party. You can't see this very clearly, but you have a party. So the party, they've got a character sheet, not the most inspiring character sheet, I must admit. Uh, where is it now? Uh, let me just do this. Okay, so they've got a character sheet. But the character sheet's got four people's names on it. Uh, can you see that? I hope you can. Let's just zoom in here. So there's four different names. Now, I haven't read the system yet. I haven't looked into it. This is just a surprise reveal for you guys. So fighting, stealth, law, survival, charisma. Okay, sounds interesting. There's a skill, there's a modified value, there's an armor value, there's a health value, there's some equipment, and there's some notes. I like the simplicity of it. I must admit, the idea of four characters, also interesting. There's a spell book here. I know that it says you can go and find and research spells and that there's an overarching plot in the entire thing. I'm excited. I'm very, very excited. I want to see more about what's going on in this uh, legendary kingdoms. There are several books that have been planned, which, again, sound exciting. So I'm going to start unpacking that and probably record a podcast of at least one of the read-throughs because, like I said, it really does sound interesting. It sounds exciting. So uh, we're going to have a look at that. So if you are not a fan of the podcast or if you're not aware of the podcast yet, it is on Patreon. You can find us on Patreon. And uh, at the moment, we're busy playing through this month's, uh, last month's module, which was a post-apocalyptic sci-fi type module. I've got uh, three, uh, 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 is it three? One, two, three three or four people, brain's gone numb, um, who are playing it from my patrons. I, I asked for Patreon volunteers. They came forward. So we've been playing that. And uh, yes, so we're, we're definitely getting getting some interesting stuff on that podcast. Once that comes to an end, which will be in three or four weeks, Legendary Kingdoms will be up next. I think that could be a lot of fun. I really do think that could be a lot of fun. Uh, there was a, a something that happened. I heard the ringing of the bells. Tavern 03, thank you. I really do appreciate that. I uh, really do appreciate that donation. So thank you for that. Okay, we've got a few minutes left. Again, we didn't get to creative writing. This is what reducing it to an hour does. But I really have so much stuff to do. There's so much stuff happening in my life at the moment. I really, really wish we had more time. I'm also moving, potentially, to the UK in January, which is only four months away. How insane is that? So anyway, there's all that kind of stuff going on. All that kind of stuff. All that craziness. All that craziness happening. Anyway, all right. So creative writing is something that we do on this channel from time to time. Although over the last three weeks, we haven't got there with this new hour-long time frame. What creative writing is, is you testing out your own skills and just trying something 
different, something that you're not used to. So a lot of these questions that are coming through, they're very good questions, don't get me wrong. They are very, 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 very good questions. But sometimes we can answer them by just stepping out of our comfort zone. Or we can come up with new ideas by trying to apply something different or something else. Um, and I think that that's something that's really, 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 really valuable to bear in mind is that with creative writing, it's not just, oh, let's let's just write a sentence and do something. So next week, with your permission, because we really don't have time to unpack it today, we will do creative writing and questions. I won't uh, talk about any other bits and bobs, although I do find it quite interesting uh, to look at these different things. But next week, we will do creative writing. So don't hate me forever. Just, um, yes, just... Uh, um, uh, know that I, I, I am aware that we haven't done it for a long time. So we definitely, definitely want to. Uh, now, James uh, Saltorella asked a question before I went to the uh, Legendary Kingdoms. So, James, let's look at your question here. What system would you recommend for running something resembling Dwarf Fortress? Basically letting the players build a base, build up an army, and potentially handle things themselves. Dwarf Fortress was that roguelike, if I remember correctly. I never played it. I'm not a fan of roguelikes personally. Um, I'm not a not a fan of Simulation as Chaos. But anyway, I beg your pardon. Dwarf Fortress, yes, you build and run a castle. So Matthew Colville released his book Stronghold, which supposedly allowed you to build fortresses. That wasn't really, from what I saw of the book, the focus. There were lots of other things in that book as well. Having said that, if you want your players to run a castle, there was a wonderful second edition book, second edition Dungeons and Dragons book, called Castles, which featured costs of how to build a castle, all the modifiers that went along with it. It was really in-depth. Uh, my good friend and I, he and I got that book, and we spent years designing castles and very carefully calculating 10 foot of stone, 10 foot wall cost 5 gold in the mountains, but in the forest it cost 12 gold, but the wood was cheaper. And so, so uh, yes, what system would I recommend you go with? It depends. Do you want the system to, to, to be really simulationist? In which case, that second edition book I can thoroughly recommend uh, in terms of being that accurate. Alternatively, if the rules themselves are not so important and it's more about the difficulties and the trials and tribulations of running a castle, then perhaps you might want to look at something like Dungeoneer or even just create your own simple system whereby uh, the, the, it, it's D&D light almost, perhaps, if, you, if you're familiar with that. So, yes, other than that, um, I'm trying to convince Dungeon Fog, it's one of my personal campaigns, uh, to get them to add in a calculator into their map making so that as you draw the castle, it calculates how much the castle costs. But I believe that that requires a lot of programming and bits and pieces in the background. So, no, anyway, um, that's one of my personal missions. So if that ever happens, uh, you know that I've been campaigning for, for a while because I do think there's a big advantage in being able to calculate how much things cost relatively quickly and relatively easily uh, then the next question that I missed so that was James and then the other one was uh, it's gone it's gone don't 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 know where it is I'm gonna go all the way to the bottom all right so sorry lost it lost it lost it lost it lost it right three minutes to go um, da, 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 da. one last question says scorch claw and um, if we still have the time how do you handle screwing up as a game master at your table? I had a player become very upset when I did something, uh, when something I did to hook their new character into the campaign wasn't what they expected and didn't make sense to them. I apologized in the moment, but not sure what to do going forward. Stor uh, Scorch Claw, we all make mistakes. They happen. And even in Ghosts of Saltmarsh, my players after the first session went, ah! What? what what was that where did that come from but they've learned to trust me that i will try and swing the story back around if they say they didn't like the beginning or they didn't like an action they didn't like this hopefully hopefully uh the um the players respect the position of the gm enough to go i wasn't happy with how that played out um this is why i wasn't happy I felt that it was too it was against the character it was this or it was that 
but um, maybe in the next session we could realize that it's a dream or that it's a nightmare or it was a flashback or a flash forward that my character was having. I don't retro stuff. I hate retconning, uh, as they say, retconning uh, stuff. Uh, oh no, that didn't actually happen last week. I hate that. So rather try and figure out a way in which, oh, that was an alternative dimension that just played out um, and, and you guys are trapped there or those are, are, are cheap tricks. But owning up to your mistake, saying, look, it was a mistake on my behalf. I apologize. OK, let's move forward. Certainly you can do that. But I do feel that you need to step back when someone criticizes or is unhappy with what has happened. Step back and ask yourself, is it a failing from your side? Is it something that you didn't understand or that you forgot or that you ignored? Or is it something that the character did not communicate, the player did not communicate effectively to you? In which case, then, it's a communications thing. So rather than focusing on the actual issue at hand, try and look at what caused that issue to get there in the first place. Was it lack of communication? In which case, then, you can learn and you can improve on the fact that it was a communications issue rather than a minutia. So always try and step back and say, OK, well, what caused that? Where did, where did that come from? Uh, again. And this happens all the time. Players get wrapped up in things. They get so many expectations built around their character. They can sometimes lash out. And then you realize, well, it's actually not because of this. It's a, a bigger thing. It's a bigger space. Anyway, those are my thoughts for this week. I um, have got a lot of things to do. So many fun things happening. Um, I hope that you do as well. I hope that your weekend will be filled with fun, whether it's watching Dimension 20's Fantasy High or hopefully joining us for Descent into Avernus on Saturday at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time or any of the other things moving forward. Uh, Kenshin1491, thank you so much for that. Really do appreciate uh, the donations. Um, you guys really do do really do 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 make this uh, uh, show worthwhile and 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 help m m moving forward. Um, so yes, uh, with regards to your question, Kenshin four nine one, any advice on outlining outlining a story? Absolutely, head on over to the um, YouTube channel. I mean, you're on the YouTube channel already, and uh, look for um, the sentence. The sentence. It is, as far as I'm concerned, a very good basis for starting an outline for your story. The sentence, someone wants something badly by a specific time and is having difficulty getting it because of whatever it is that they're trying to do. It's a very, very strong basis, although I have been doing research into how Eastern stories are written. That is to say, stories emanating predominantly from Japan and Asia. And there's some very interesting things that, have, uh, that I have had the awesome benefit of discovering. And I will obviously communicate that to you in the form of a video uh, in the next couple of weeks. The differences and why and how we can use those differences to improve our storytelling. Anyway, until next week, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming. Oh.